So I want to begin by thanking everyone who's joined us on this Friday morning, particularly after a big parliamentary week, and particularly to thank Mr Philip Dykes QC, the Hong Kong barrister and current chair of the Council of the Hong Kong Bar Association, who's our speaker. Just to run through some organising things, Philip's going to speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll go to Q&A. Please do feel free to um, put any questions that occur to you as this is going along in the chat. Um, also, you can raise your hand using the blue raise hand function, which is uh, attached at the bottom of the, for most people anyway, at the list of participants. Um, we are recording this, so be aware that this is being recorded and will go out on social channels. And just thinking about the questions that you're asking, um, what we're very much aiming to ensure is that um, we don't create any difficulties for anyone on, the, on this call. So um, we need to ensure that um, we're not talking about what this APPG or people in the UK can do to help. We're talking about the situation in Hong Kong. And you, usually on APPGs, one chairs very gently, but in this case, I will interrupt anyone if they start a question that's heading into areas that I think could create difficulties. Um, I think that's covered all of the admin that I need to cover. Um, so a brief introduction to Mr. Philip Dykes QC, uh, who, as I've already said, is the uh, current chair of the Council of the Hong Kong Bar Association. Um, he's got a practice in constitutional and administrative law um, and this is our description from the APPG as a strong voice defending the rule of law in Hong Kong. He was first called to the bar in 1977 and practiced on the Northern Circuit from the chambers of HK Goddard QC in Manchester. So just across the Pennines from where I'm speaking to you. He went to Hong Kong in 1985 and joined the Attorney General's chambers. So without further ado, over to you, Philip. Thanks very much. I'm invited to address you to give my views on the current situation in Hong Kong as it relates to the legal system, the judiciary, and the prospects of achieving a democratic system of government as contemplated in the Joint Declaration and the Basic Law. Uh, members will know, because uh, you would just refer to it, that the free exchange of views between persons and groups in Hong Kong and overseas bodies have been affected by the recently promulgated uh, national security law. Severe criminal sanctions, a minimum sentence imprisonment of three years and a maximum of life term may now apply if things are said or done that cause harm to the vital interests of the Central People's Government or the government of the Hong Kong SER as identified in the collusion offence in Article 29 of the National Security Law. And this offence applies to bodies outside Hong Kong. And as a matter of recent news, you may not know, the newspaper proprietor Jimmy Lai has this morning been charged with this very offence. The allegation is apparently that he's accepted interviews from foreign governments and may cause for sanctions to be imposed in Hong Kong. So nothing that I say today should be taken by you as soliciting support or any action on your part that may fall foul of Article 29. What I have to offer your group is my take on the situation here. I give it to you from the perspective of a lawyer with 35 years professional practice in Hong Kong, first as a government lawyer concerned with handover issues, and since 1992 as a barrister practicing in the field of administrative and constitutional law. Most of what I've said, what I will say, I've said to local and international press representatives in the past few weeks. I begin though with the joint declaration ratified in May 1985 the very month I arrived in Hong Kong. As I go back to basics, it's worth it. The Joint Declaration is important because, as you probably know, it provided the template for a new constitutional order under, the Chinese, under Chinese sovereignty, namely governance under the basic law for a Hong Kong special limited region under Article 31 of the Chinese Constitution. Article 31 allow for areas within the PRC to be run along different lines from the mandated socialist system, applying everywhere else in the country. 
quote, in the light of specific conditions in the special administrative region. The specific conditions that apply to Hong Kong were that under the joint declaration, the UK undertook the return of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty and that the PRC simultaneously undertook the creation of a special administrative region enjoying, quote, a high degree of autonomy that would include, quote, executive, legislative, and independent judicial power, including that of final adjudication, and that the laws in force at the time would remain, quote, basically unchanged. This commitment is found in Article 3 of the Joint Declaration, which outlined China's basic policies. Sub clause 12 of that article referred to an elaboration of these basic policies in an annex to the Joint Declaration which does what the sub clause says it will do. That's to say it puts meat on the bare bones of Article 3 in 14 sections or chapters, which deal with finances and civil aviation down to human rights and the legal and judicial systems. The basic law promulgated in 1991, but dormant until 1997, is a further elaboration of the People's Republic of China's basic policies the Joint Declaration. Recently, the PRC has repudiated the Joint Declaration by saying it is no longer relevant and is a historical document only. In my view, that position is hard to accept, given the language of the obligation in the Joint Declaration, the fact is a solemn treaty launched with the United Nations, and it's meant to create rights and obligations, albeit it's a treaty without an enforcement mechanism. The current Chinese stance is even more difficult to square with the basic law itself. The preamble, the preamble to the basic law refers to the joint declaration and says that China's basic policies have been elaborated in the joint declaration and that the basic law cannot be amended to remove them. And that's a reference to basic law article 159. The basic law has not been amended since 1997 but there have been profound changes affecting those basic policies. The shocks to the Hong Kong legal system have come through the acts of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. Some of these acts have been through the established mechanisms of the basic law, some of them have not. I turn to the Standing Committee and five of its actions that had the greatest effect in the past four years. I begin with the basic law interpretation of uh, Article 104. The article, sorry, the interpretation of the article in late 2016 concerned oath taking by newly elected legislators in the pro democracy camp. Two newly elected legislators took the oath in what was a highly offensive manner to the Hong Kong government and the central authorities, with the result that the oaths were rejected by the Clark to the Legislative Council. The new legislators were offered a chance to take the oaths again the following week. Before that could be done, the government applied to the court for a declaration that the legislators were already disqualified for spoiling the oath required under Basic Law Article 104. The lawmaker's case was that although the court had the power to rule on the validity of the oath, because of the separation of powers uh, and the clerk's offer to let them take it again, the court should not intervene. Before the court could deliver judgment over a weekend, um, the standing committee interpreted basic law 104 and said that the oaths were invalid and there was no second chances. The interpretation was then used by the courts to disqualify four more pro-democracy legislators who had deviated from the wording of the oath, albeit in a less provocative manner. The interpretation has been applied by court to justify candidacy, candidacy screening by election officials to decide whether a person is likely to be true to his or her oath. Those disqualified from standing for election have invariably been pro-democrats but the process had been marked by procedural unfairness, not giving a would-be candidate the chance to make a response, such that judges have quashed 
shun disqualification decisions in election petition cases that have resulted in bar elections. The Hong Kong government has returned to the topic of the official oath very recently. It now proposes that senior civil servants swear a loyalty oath and that uh, others make a declaration to the same effect. Uh, that would uh, encompass um, a declaration of oaths taken by 180,000 civil servants. Details have yet to be announced. My own concern is that these new oaths and declarations might be used as patriotism tests to exclude people from office. Such as happened in England 350 years ago with the Test and Corporation Acts or more recently in the United States in the 1950s, screening reliability, screening candidates for public positions for political reliability. Second major decision, sorry, decision having a major effect, was the introduction of mainland laws outside the basic law um, for inclusion in our laws. Mainland laws are not to apply to the Hong Kong SCR unless they're included in an annex to the basic law. And the basic law, Article 18, mainland laws included in the annex are meant to relate to defense, foreign affairs, and other matters outside the autonomy of the Hong Kong SAR. The decision of the Standing Committee in December of 2017, applying the body of mainland law to railway station facilities in Kowloon, uh, we call this collocation. The issue really was whether the basic law only arguably permitted the application of mainland law incidental to the operation of limited passport and customs control, rather like uh, uh, that which obtains with the Eurostar, or whether all of mainland criminal law might be imported to the railway station. The SCMPC decision was that all criminal law would apply so that a Hong Kong resident could be arrested in Hong Kong in the railway station and taken to the mainland, as occurred in the case, I think you know, to the British consul official Simon Chen. The import of mainland law occurred without recourse to Article 18 of the Basic Law, uh, which, as I say, provides that mainland laws can apply to Hong Kong if included in an annex. A Hong Kong court ruled that the arrangements were compatible with the Basic Law. That decision could have been appealed up to the Court of Final Appeal, but the, real, the really final, final appeal decision would have been to the uh, Standing Committee itself under the interpretation of clause in Basic Law 158. And it would be inconceivable to think that the Standing Committee would hold that its decision to approve the collocation agreement was against the Basic Law. Third one is mainland bodies operating in the Hong Kong SCR. In April 2020, the mainland liaison office in Hong Kong claimed the right to speak out on Hong Kong affairs and offer guidance to the Hong Kong government. It claimed that Article 22 of the Basic Law, which forbids mainland bodies established in the Hong Kong SCR from interfering in Hong Kong's affairs, did not apply to it, notwithstanding 23 years of it refraining from interfering in Hong Kong affairs. And even the Hong Kong government appeared surprised at the claim because it had earlier said that uh, Article 22 of the Basic Law applied to the Liaison Office. Since then, the Liaison Office has been vocal and directed the Hong Kong government on various issues, including statements that the judiciary may be in need of reform and that everyone needs to recalibrate their views of the basic law in light of the fact that it does not incorporate the separation of powers arrangement. Uh, the liaison office also recently said that Chinese patriots are needed to run Hong Kong. Uh, no separation of powers under the basic law is a new legal orthodoxy promoted by the liaison office. It has been embraced by the Chief Executive and the Secretary of Justice, even though courts in Hong Kong have used the separation of powers doctrine for the last 20 odd years, and the Hong Kong government had not appealed a case on the grounds that this was heresy. I turn to the national security law. It was promulgated on the 30th of June, and it was done without any consultation or recourse to Hong Kong in any way. Although Hong Kong has been given a legislative competence 
to enact on its own laws, sorry, on its own laws concerning treason, secession, sedition, subversion, and theft of state secrets in Basic Law Article 23, and it's not done so. The Standing Committee claimed that enacting laws concerning offences against national security was outside the competence of the Hong Kong SEM and that therefore it could act under Article 18, that is to say, apply a mainland law directly. I anticipate members may have questions about this law, so I won't go into great detail about it, but I identify some of its more unusual features. It's a mainland drafted law, and it's quite alien to lawyers trained in the common law tradition. It has not been promulgated together with an authentic English version, as is the case with all laws enacted in Hong Kong, even the basic law. The result is that lawyers who do not read Chinese are unable to submit to the courts on its meaning directly. Secondly, the law requires the Hong Kong government to promote safeguarding national security at all levels, including education in schools, social organizations, and the media, in order to raise awareness. That's chapter two of the uh, National Security Law, part one. Formation of the National Security Safeguarding Committee and the supervision of the CPG. The committee includes the chief executive and major government officials, including the Secretary of Justice. Membership also includes a mainland national security advisor. The committee has an unlimited budget for its work. That's chapter two, part two. Four new offenses, secession, subversion, terrorist activities and collusion with foreign entities to endanger national security. All these with graded minimum prison sentences. However, procedures and penalties apply to other unnamed offenses that are classified, that are called endangering national security. And those include disqualification from public or political or judicial office, see Article 35. And the national security law does not define national security. Uh, extraterritorial application to offences under this law to Hong Kong residents living overseas and people who have, been, who have no residential status in Hong Kong. This is chapter 3, articles 37 and 38. Article 37 is a concern to Hong Kong students studying abroad who fear that their activities may be monitored and reported to the Hong Kong police who will arrest them when they return. As for foreigners who transgress the law, Article 38 will follow the basis for arrest and prosecution should they ever come to Hong Kong. Next, extraordinary investigative and penalty measures under Chapter 4, Article 43. These allow for warrantless searches, uh, wiretaps without judicial authority, confiscation of property, not just for the offences created by the national security law, but for other offences, quote, endangering national security. Um, the Secretary of Justice had revived the colonial offence of uh, sedition after over 50 years and has claimed that it's an offence endangering national security, notwithstanding the fact that it was triable by a magistrate only and is punishable with only its two years imprisonment. Next is a compromise of judicial independence by allowing the chief executive to handpick judges from the existing pool for offences endangering national security. That's chapter four, article 44. The national security judges are a limited tenure, one year, and can be, can be sacked if they make statements or behave in such a way as to endanger national security. A judge can be thoroughly impartial and scrupulously fair, but if selected by the chief executive to try cases, he or she is not independent, as that word is used in international human rights law, which requires that judges be institutionally separate from the executive. Offenses endangering national security may be tried by a jury and must be tried by with a jury of seven in the High Court if more than seven years imprisonment is sought. Uh, the way it works here is that if prosecution seeks a lesser sentence, 
they can be tried by a district court judge who has power to sentence people up to seven years imprisonment, or a magistrate who can sentence you to two years imprisonment maximum. Article 46 and Chapter 4 say that jury trial can be dispensed with and replaced by trial with a panel of three High Court judges on what are specified grounds, but which include, quote, protection of state secrets, involvement of foreign factors in the case, and the protection of the personal safety of jurors and their family members. The first prosecution under the national security law that will go on for trial concerns a motorcyclist riding in the street the day after the national security law came into effect. He displayed a banner bearing the legend, Liberate Hong Kong, Revolution of Our Times, and collided with police officers who attempted to stop him and injured some of them. He's been charged with two national security uh, offenses, terrorism and secession. He will be tried in the High Court where there's a possibility of a, a life sentence being imposed for the offense of secession and 10 years for terrorism. It will be interesting to see if he is afforded a jury trial or whether his trial will take place before a panel of judges. Chapter 5 of the law establishes a special office for safeguarding national security with intelligence gathering responsibilities, coordination functions, and some police powers, uh, and funded by the central people's government. Under Article 55, it can select some cases thought to be too complex or beyond the complex, sorry, beyond the competence of the SR and render the defendant for trial in the mainland under mainland laws. Uh, the office is not subject to jurisdiction of the Hong Kong SAR, Article 60. Chapter 6, Article 62 says that the national security law prevails over all other local laws, and Article 65 vests a simple power of interpretation, unlike the power of interpretation at Article 158 of the Basic Law in the Standing Committee. Uh, so to that extent, uh, the Court of Final Appeal is a court, certainly, of semi-final appeal. The fifth and final decision I we should talk about is the decision uh, last month, which resulted in the disqualification of four LegCo members. The decision in November triggering the disqualification of four LegCo members and the resignation of all pro-democracy legislators. The current term of LegCo ended in September and elections were to be held then. In July, four members were told that they could not stand because it was thought that they would not be faithful to the uh, Legislative Council oath. Eight others who were first-time candidates were also disqualified. Before they could do anything about challenging that decision, the Chief Executive postponed the election by a year, using a 1922 law uh, uh, concerning public emergencies. The Standing Committee endorsed the decision, even though it contradicted Article 69 of the Basic Law, which stipulates that Legislative Council have four-year terms. No explanation was given as to why a four-year term could become a five-year term. Be that as it may, the decision meant that all sitting members would continue in place, including the awkward squad of the four LegCo members who've been told they were not fit to hold office, and they would be disqualified next time round. On the 11th of November, a platform for kicking these four out was provided by the Standing Committee, which has visited its decision on oaths, and elaborated on it, and set out criteria for patriotic lawmakers. The Chief Executive acted on that decision, and I emphasize it's not, it was not an interpretation or a law, and disqualified the four lawmakers without giving them a chance to explain their position. This qualification, as you probably know, prompted the resignation of the 15 remaining pro-democracy lawmakers. It's left 41 pro-establishment lawmakers and two uh, independents who remained, uh, who, uh, sorry, and uh, I characterize it as um, a self-executing pride's purge. 
many legislators considered that they would have no chance of getting through the rigorous screening process to determine their fitness to stand for election next year, and that opposing the government vigorously in the remaining term was simply to provide grounds for later candidacy disqualification decision. As for the state of the judiciary, the Secretary of Justice organized a conference about four weeks ago to promote better understanding of the basic law. Mainland officials uh, uh, present call for a better understanding of the basic law as a product of the Chinese constitution, which they suggested had some specified legal effect in Hong Kong. The heresy of the separation of powers was excoriated again, and those remarks were directed at the judiciary. N there is no doubt there is pressure on the judiciary. The Bar Council has issued about a dozen statements deprecating attacks on judges and criminal, and criminal damage done to court buildings in the past three years. Uh, two of these statements um, in the past three weeks. One of these statements concerned a virulent attack in a pro regime newspaper on a judge who uh, had given judgment for the Hong Kong Judges Association in a judicial review about the inadequacy of the police complaint system and of officers hiding identifying insignia in protest. The article suggested that the judge supported the rioters. The other uh, uh, cons the statement concerned a death threat to the national security law designated magistrate who had remanded the newspaper of party I referred to earlier, Jim Eli, in custody for an alleged fraud offense. I was, I had been bar chairman before, about 15 years ago. In my two years at, at the term then, no statements like this were issued at all. As for foreign judges, they've been in the news, uh, the Legislative Council yesterday endorsed the appointment of Lord Reed as a new non-permanent judge. One legislator said I warned that the new judges needed to be fully understand the one country, two system system, meaning the new view as uh, uh, propagated by uh, um, the, um, the ASOC office. Another is reported to have said that non-permanent judges should not deal with cases concerning Hong Kong main relations, or, and this is interesting, rather curious, cases concerning gay marriage. I personally should, should be sorry to see non permanent judges from the UK not coming to Hong Kong anymore, uh, even in, in these difficult times. Uh, I think they've got much to burnish the reputation of the court, and I know that my view is shared uh, in the legal profession. As for democracy, the very modest developments towards democracy have been completely reversed. The present LEGCO resembles a truncated version of the 1991 colonial LEGCO, which had 39 elected members, 21 came from fractional constituencies, and 18 were returned by direct elections, and 18 were appointed by the government. By my reckoning, 24 of the remaining 43 LEGCO members are uh, representatives and functional constituencies. That's to say they've been elected by special interest groups, such as those who work in finance, insurance, textiles, engineering, real estate, agriculture, and fisheries. LEGCO now has no effective opposition, and although some remaining members are pledged to be critical of the government, legislative proposals, it is in reality, in my opinion, a completely new to body. And I believe it will do the Hong Kong government's bidding on all important matters. The chief executive has said that she's no intention to visit Article 45 um, in the foreseeable future, uh, which of course is the article which lays out a, a progressive route to achieving uh, universal suffrage. I personally don't foresee the Hong Kong government will ever have general elections where anyone can stand for election without first undergoing vetting for political fitness. As it been said many times before, the CCP has no objection to elections conducted in accordance with the principle of universal suffrage so long as it can select the candidates who stand. Finally, the 
chief executive had boasted of her achievement of returning peace and tranquility to Hong Kong. I agree that she's done this, but if you look for the peace and tranquility in a graveyard of legitimate political hopes and aspirations and stifled and dissenting voices. As the Roman historian Tacitus said, recording the words of a Celtic chieftain who was not impressed with the benefits of Roman civilization that was offered to him, they, he said, the Romans, make a solitude and call it peace. So it is with Hong Kong. Thank you for listening to me. I'd be glad to take a, a question. Well, thank you very much and a very powerful ending point there uh, with, with the reference. Um, Chris Patton, I think that's your hand up if you'd like to, uh, you're already unmuted to ask a question. I'm just going to remind everyone before you do, just to note that as we've already discussed about the national security law in Article 24, um, that we're not going to be talking about what uh, this APPG or what indeed what the UK could, could be doing. We're talking about the situation in Hong Kong and that's the way uh, questions need to be directed. Sorry, Chris, over to you. First of all, um, I'd like to, I hope this doesn't and do you any um, damage, uh, Philip? Um, I'd like to uh, say how much um, I think everybody who follows these issues in the UK and elsewhere recognizes the integrity with which the Hong Kong Bar Association have acted uh, throughout. Uh, and uh, personally, and I'm sure others feel the same, I've hugely welcomed the clarity um, of the commentaries and the statements you've made about um, the events of the last year. Um, I think it's been a, an exemplary example uh, of a profession living up to its highest standards. I just want to make one clarifying point and then ask one question about the Court of Final Appeal. The clarifying point is it's true that there are still um, uh, representatives of functional constituencies, but of course they represent far fewer people than was the case um, in 19, from 1995 to 1997, uh, when the functional constituencies membership um, was increased by about uh, 2 million to incorporate everybody in particular professions or work. Um, so that's been another change um, in the system of accountability, quite apart from the, the more recent um, uh, changes. Um, the question I want to uh, ask is this, given the governments, view um, insofar as um, the government's view is any different from that of, of Beijing, um, attacking the separation of powers. What is the role left for the Court of Final Appeal? Um, I think that um, we all understand the argument put by lawyers in Hong Kong that it's important for us to continue to try to ensure the legal integrity and autonomy of the Court of Final Appeal. But there presumably comes a point at which um, its role is compromised in a way which would not be helpful for Hong Kong or for the rule of law. Um, I shouldn't perhaps lead you into asking what that point might be, but I'd just like you to, you, you referred a little to the weakening of the position of the Court of Final Appeal and because of uh, one or two recent decisions. At, at, at what point would Lord Reed or um, Baroness Hale or others um, rightly conclude, because these are decisions they have to make themselves, I very much hope that the British government won't, um, won't uh, push them or parliamentarians won't, won't push them. These are independent judges. Um, at what point would they be, you think, inclined to take the view um, that uh, getting on a plane and flying to Hong Kong um, was uh, not uh, doing any good for the rule of law. I accept what you say, that it's a personal decision for a, a not a judge. They all take the judicial oath and there may come a time when they feel that, well, we can't continue. I, I think that it would occur, possibly, in a case where um, an issue like the separation of powers was the point in the case and uh, the case went up to the Court of Final Appeal, and there was then an interpretation which flatly reversed the Court of Final Appeal. And uh, that would be uh, very significant. We uh, we don't have 
separation of powers that you have in the United Kingdom or the United States. It is a separation of powers which gives a, a, a great deal of uh, weight to uh, executive power. But we have, nonetheless, independent judiciary, a, 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 a legislature which tries to hold the, should hold the, the executive accountable and the executive branch. But a case which turn on the issue of separation of powers and to be told by the um, standing committee that you're wrong about that, there is no separation of powers, that would be um, pretty disastrous. Thank you. Okay, so um, opening up now to other questions um, and also Philip perhaps if you can just in answering lean a little closer to your microphone that that might might um, make it a little easier to hear um, so anyone who wants to ask a question um, you can there's the raise um, hand function in uh, underneath the list of participants or you can leave a note in the chat box or just wave and um, I and others will be watching out for anyone who wishes to wave and ask questions um, while people are thinking about that perhaps um, Philip, if I can just ask you what's happening in terms of um, the legal profession in Hong Kong, um, you know, I'm thinking about you know, young people, older people, uh, what, you know, how are people feeling at the moment? What's the general general state for people carrying out their lives as, as lawyers, as legal practitioners? I made it my business to try and find out what the um, sentiment of uh, the bar is, particularly the younger bar. I can tell you that Barristers between the ages of about 25 and 35, many of them are making plans to leave Hong Kong and uh, uh, equify elsewhere, whether that be the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, wh wh whatever. Uh, those plans will be executed probably in 12, 18 months' time. It's not going to happen immediately. But I've uh, been consulted by a number of young barristers about this. As the barristers over 35 who have family, it's very difficult, particularly to, to relocate and start practice again. They would be inclined to uh, st stick with it for a, a little bit longer. But I've heard of, um, of uh, other professionals, uh, doctors, dentists, Accountants making their plans to uh, uh, leave again, not immediately because travel plans are inhibited by the current condition of the coronavirus. But uh, uh, let's see, um, I, 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 I just today been asked to write a reference letter for one barrister who's got, got, planning to go. Um, but I think that's also true of solicitors. Many younger solicitors would also consider going away and uh, requalifying. Thank you. Um, I can't at the moment see any other hands, so I'll just put in another question myself, which is a sort of big piece, picture question of what do you attribute this change in approach from Beijing to? Um, and I, I suppose the second question attached to that is, is what do you think is the end point? What's, what's Beijing's ultimate aim? So why is it heading this way and, and where is it trying to go? The protests of last year, they, they, they were unacceptable to Beijing. Uh, they were managed by the Hong Kong government with great difficulty, uh, but the, uh, the uh, central government has now stepped in and uh, said there'll be no more of this. The national security law, as I've outlined to you, contains some pretty scary offences, and they are, the law is being enforced with vigour, particularly amongst uh, younger people, students. So we've had uh, well, uh, two arrests this week, uh, one, one, one more today uh, that I read of, and uh, uh, they would say they would use uh, English partners, they would stand no nonsense. And I say, it's down to uh, the, in the outpouring of intense dissatisfaction with uh, the Hong Kong government and the lack of progress towards democracy that spilled over into mass demonstrations, uh, a million or more ma people marching. 
um, the story is, the contention is, oh, that these protests were funded by foreign agents, but you know, foreign enterprises do not fund a million people to go on a march. And um, that's the reason. Uh, it's, it's as simple as that. Thank you very much. Now, I see Hugh Trenchard, you've got a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask it yourself if you, if you wish to? Your unmute button's probably down in the bottom left of your screen, most likely. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Natalie. Yeah, I, um, I read some weeks back that the US government had suspended the free trade agreement with Hong Kong. I wondered whether that had had any noticeable effect. <clears throat> whether what, what uh, attitude the public had to that um, and also whether the incoming Biden transition team has said anything about Hong Kong and about whether it intends to continue the suspension or to go back to where it was before. I'm aware of the uh, statement by the incoming Biden team which which was the effect that they would still take a close interest in what's going on in Hong Kong, and that uh, the uh, direction taken by the Trump administration would be maintained initially. As for the um, trade agreement, I, um, I'm, not, I, I'm aware of trade privileges being uh, uh, withdrawn from uh, Hong okay. Kong, and um, they have really not affected Hong Kong because Hong Kong is not really a, a manufacturing centre uh, anymore. Uh, we thrive on financial services and uh, uh, re-exporting, but uh, that's not been a, a, a great concern in Hong Kong. Although the administration here regards it as being very irritating. Thank you. Okay, Francis de Souza, if you'd like to unmute yourself, thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thanks so much. Um, I wonder whether you could say something about whether or not you think there's going to be any room for free uh, media comment journalism in, in areas which are not necessarily contentious. I mean, thinking about finance, um, but also not just the indigenous media, but uh, what kind of action would the authorities be taking, if any, against uh, reporters? for The Economist, for the Financial Times, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there, there, there's a history of uh, uh, the government acting uh, against uh, foreign journalists. You know, two, two years ago, financial um, times journalists. If you can just lean forward a bit, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> financial times journalists um, failed to have a visa renewed. Um, the I know the Journalists Association um, is very concerned about it, it etc. They've seen uh, reporters harassed and arrested in the street. I referred in my presentation to a court case that they brought successfully against the police. Uh, the police have said immediately they'll appeal. It's not fair to the police, uh, but they, it has the effect of um, intimidating uh, reporters. You know, very, very recently we had a, an investigative journalist who appeared to expose links between police and triads who had got together, to be, uh, who had, uh, who had uh, organized themselves to beat up returning processors at a Yulong uh, railway station. Um, uh, a program, an hour long program I'll let this story presented here. Um, she was then arrested about two weeks ago for um, ob obtaining information about license plates, who they belong to, uh, uh, contrary to um, uh, re requirements. If you want to find out about a, um, a, a license plate, you fill in the form and set out the reasons why. She's alleged to have misrepresented the reason why, but it's um, other journalists say that 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 would never have happened before. That's something completely new. That level of uh, harassment. Um, no, um, 
I, I, I believe that journalists here, uh, they do by and large a good job, but it's a difficult job and it's getting more difficult. And I believe that the, there's an index on the journalism standards that Hong Kong had achieved quite high uh, rating a year ago, I think 16th or 18th, we dropped down now to 18th in a year. Uh, that's largely because of the hostility towards the free press. Am I close enough now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that, I think that, that's better. Thank you. It just makes it a little easier to hear. Um, uh, I'm opening, we've got about uh, 10 more minutes for, for more questions, but if I can just ask a couple of my own flowing on from what you said about the senior civil servants having to swear allegiance and the, um, the declarations for the others. And also the, um, the court case you mentioned with about the motorcyclist with the banner. What's the time frame for this? How fast are things are moving? When will that first court case be? When do you expect those declarations of that to come forward? Is it something that's sort of speeding on or is it going to be a process over, over months? There was a newspaper article today uh, that the government announced what it would do, how many people would take it, have to take this, and you get the impression that they would um, not take long because it's uh, administratively quite simple. Uh, so the de declarations for most people will be a matter of signing a piece of paper. Uh, the swearing formally or an oath will be limited to senior civil servants. And as for the High Court case, uh, the case has been transferred from the Magistrates Court to the um, High Court. I don't know when it will, will take place. From looking, looking at the case, it was quite a simple case. You're not talking about a, a case with lots of documents. It's about a man riding a motorcycle, bearing a banner, and colliding with police officers. So it's not going to be evidentially complex. So it might come on for trial in the new year. And do you have a sense that there's a real push from Beijing, from, from the administration, to, to get things really sorted really quickly? I mean, thinking perhaps with the elections, the, the alleged co-elections coming up, etc. cetera? Uh, I don't know if th that timing is uh, uppermost in their mind, but certainly a lot of resources have been put into uh, uh, investigating these um, uh, uh, offences. Like I said before, like I said in my presentation, they've got a limited budget. And uh, the, the government's making sure of things when the, the premises of Apple Daily were uh, raided in uh, early August. I think 200 police officers turned out en masse to do the job. It's a demonstration of, of uh, force, demonstration of intention, and uh, barely a week goes by without reading of new national security law charges. As I say, it's quite quiet for the first few weeks, but now the, um, the, uh, the, um, the investigation authorities are really getting underway. Thank you. Quite, um, quite, quite quickly too, there was a case of some students uh, two weeks ago um, chanting separatist slogans, and they've been arrested at the beginning of the week uh, under the national security law. Um, Chris Patton, I wonder if there's, if you'd like to come back with it with any more questions or, or thoughts. Well, I'd just like to thank um, Philip once again for um, the uh, honesty uh, that he's given us um, within the constraints um, of the NSL, which makes it difficult um, to note that there are some still some I won't mention them some, some excellent ways of finding out what's going on in Hong Kong through the media crowdfunded media and I just wonder um, how long that will continue and I just like to observe um, uh, in, in the light of what um, Philip has said about um, the way the law is used and the its comprehensive intimidatory nature uh, I just like to mention that remark of the uh, American uh, Sinophile scholar, Perry Lynx, who was a great expert on Chinese literature, who used to refer to the law in China as like the anaconda in the chandelier. Um, don't quite know when or whether the 
python will fall uh, on you um but you know it's up there um and it makes you um jolly reluctant to take any risks when it comes to making jokes or singing songs and um, certainly not singing glory to the hong kong um or um referring critically um to the uh, authorities um in beijing the um as as we all know um the leadership believes very strongly that in order to love china you have to love the communist party which i think um has been difficult for people in taiwan to swallow and difficult for people in hong kong to swallow but i hope that the world um not just in britain but the rest of the world will continue to take very active interest in what's happening in hong kong i think it will because hong kong is only one example of why we should take much more notice of uh chinese behavior internationally but i want to, once again i want to say that if the rule of law still survives in hong kong it will be because of people like philip dykes colleagues thank you well pat you'll be relieved to know we don't run to chandeliers in my chambers so i don't have any fear of them and i can't be dropping something into the sky <laughs> Well, I have to say, as someone who lived in uh, Thailand for five years and was a journalist in Thailand, I'm, I'm familiar with similar kind of circumstances. The uh, the rule of law being 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 a, a theory rather than rather than a practical situation is is something that was uh, very experienced to in, in being a journalist in Thailand. Um, anyone just wondering if anyone has any final pressing questions we're almost out of time but i do just want to make sure particularly anyone who hasn't on this call who hasn't asked a question yet or anyone who has asked a question who'd like to ask another one uh, i note that in the chat that sarah champion apologized she's one of our uh, deputy chairs she apologized she had to go but she was saying how useful and, and helpful this had been um i'm not seeing any other hands way oh yeah, chris were you waving a hand um, yes just very briefly to contribute um, whilst Mr. Dykes was actually talking about um, the point theoretically that may be reached when it becomes likely that judges from the United Kingdom might decide not to continue to serve, uh, we received a two-page letter during that comment from um, the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice in response to a letter that was sent to him on that. Um, I will circulate a copy so that Mr. Dykes has it, as well as all those on the call. Um, it doesn't differ fundamentally from what Mr. Dykes was expressing by way of his expectations. Okay, I, th I think we're, we've now got to the point, I don't know, uh, Philip, if there's anything else you would like to add, any final thoughts you'd like to share with us? No, I would be grateful for the attention that you uh, uh, paid uh, to us. It's appreciated. Well, you, all I need to say then to conclude is to thank you very, very much for your time, for all of your work. I uh, saw a tweet yesterday, which I thought was rather fascinating. It was the new German ambassador uh, to the UK um, was presenting uh, his credentials to the Queen uh, with his wife beside him and all of the, all of the uh, in a very, very formal, pompous kind of room. Uh, and of course, the uh, the Queen is on a Zoom screen. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's a reminder, I, I was looking at it thinking, you know, that much of the form has not changed since the time of Queen Elizabeth I. Um, but then a lot has changed also. And, you know, we're operating in, in difficult times. And one of the things we have is a lot of information these days but what's really crucial is is keeping open the lines of communication people being able to talk to each other people being able to understand and you know, that's always been the role of diplomats it's the role of everybody to share information to increase international understanding and that you know i think in my view has to be a good thing so Thank you very, very much, Philip Dykes, for your time. Thank you, everyone who's come along today. Uh, the APPG on Hong Kong, I'm sure we'll have more events coming up and you'll all be most welcome. And you know, we will keep uh, working to share information and make sure people are able to share views. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good, a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.